we'll just start with Dr. Martin's introduction for uh, uh, just to warm up the session, as I would always say. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Martins. Um, it's seriously a pleasure and an honor. Uh, thank you so much for taking out time from your busy schedule uh, to speak with us and our uh, dear students. Um, it's a very warm welcome uh, to you from us. Thank you, Anke, the Jindal Society of International Law, and Dr. Popovsky, who is our course coordinator for uh, Law and Practice of the United Nations. So I don't think this would have been possible without the joint effort of Dr. Poposki and um, especially the society, the students of International Society of International Law. So uh, today we have amongst us Dr. Martins and it is a pleasure and an honor. Uh, he is a reader and associate professor in public international law at University College London. Um, he's a generalist public international lawyer with a variety of specialist interests. And Dr. Martins has published uh, with the American Journal of International Law, the British Yearbook of International Law, the European Journal of International Law, and the Modern Law Review um, for his monograph uh, with Oxford Monograph Series in International Law, and uh, is the author on state responsibility in the forthcoming 10th edition of Oppenheim uh, Peace. Um, his work has regularly been cited by international tribunals, domestic courts on issues of international law, which uh, obviously, uh, you know, credits to uh, the authority and the clarity and his contribution to uh, the field of law and legal theory. And uh, Dr. Martins is also a book review editor of the Journal of World Investment and Trade, uh, a co-editor of Current Legal Problems and a member of the editorial board of UCL Press. Um, at present, he's also a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, a conciliator at the OSCE Court of Conciliation and Arbitration, and the member of the ICSID panels of arbitrators and of conciliators. Again, Dr. Martin, such a pleasure and honor, and uh, thank you for speaking with us today. The floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Akriti, uh, for the very, very kind, undeservedly kind words of introduction. Uh, Thank you uh, to Ankit as well for being uh, ceaselessly on top of all organizational things. Thank you to Dr. Popovsky for being, as I understand, the inspiration behind everything. So uh, what I want to talk to you today is um, building on a recent article of mine. As Akriti mentioned, uh, I have published in the modern more of you and just, you know, even in these modern times actually happen to have the paper copy of the uh, last last November's issue. So this is really still a fairly uh, fresh uh, paper. And the good thing about it is that it is an open access. So if you just Google it, you are able to access it freely. So what I want to talk about today is um, a topic of state responsibility. So if we want to intellectually, as it were, put ourselves in a certain field, that would be the international law of state responsibility, something intrinsically related with the United Nations. It is impossible to think about contemporary law of state responsibility without thinking about the United Nations and in particular the very important subsidiary organ of the United Nations General Assembly, International Law Commission. So I appreciate that students have really looked at this um, questions of international law mostly from the perspective of the broader international institutional setting and so that is also something that we'll be emphasizing throughout. So what is it that uh, I'm interested in? I think it's in these cases, it's really best to illustrate it by a number of examples, and some of them are indeed quite close uh, to home. Let me just show a number of those. Uh, this is a case that was decided in December last year between a large uh, British investor in the energy market and 
Republic of India. So you see the nice uh, pre-Christmas uh, present. Uh, a longish award, I think you certainly, um, you should, uh, brevity is a soul of wit. I think it's a takeaway that one need not write hundreds of pages to get the point. But I think we'll just do a shortcut and we'll just go to the very end. We are interested in what was beside it. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, India did not prevail on the merits of this case. And the amount that India was identified as having to pay was a significant one. So it's sort of it's composed of a number of things, but it goes for more than one billion dollars. So that is a recent example from that setting. And you might think that perhaps investor state arbitration has its own uh, thing going on. But similar questions may also arise in other settings. So let's uh, take the example from the most august uh, judicial body, International Court of Justice. And this is a case that you may re recall uh, from your studies on use of force, the armed activities on the territory of the Congo between DRC and Uganda is one of the foundational judgments of the International Court of Justice on the use of force. And quite a few years ago, so say about 15-ish years ago or so, the court uh, ruled on the merit, leaving, however, the question of reparation open, but it identified fairly significant breaches on the merit. And so just, you know, just in a few weeks, from 20th to 30th of April, later this month, the court will be listening to arguments specifically on the question of reparation. Now, a bit annoyingly, we do not know what is the amount of reparation discussed in this case. Uh, because in the process of the International Court of Justice, written pleadings are not published until the beginning of the oral uh, pleadings on a particular matter, and the oral pleadings have been postponed several times. But it seems likely, uh, or at least plausible in light of the substance of the case, that this could also be a very significant uh, multi-billion case. Now, this is just my, as it were, educated guess, and perhaps I'm wrong, but that seems like a plausible hypothesis. And these are not the only cases. So again, uh, to go uh, closer uh, to the region uh, in uh, July 2019, uh, Pakistan lost a very a significant case against uh, another investor and you no, know, this is you know, we are getting in multiples of billions now. And the interesting point for Pakistan is that uh, so if you are following, as it were, the broader financial developments in the region, that in July of 2019, Pakistan also secured a credit from the International Monetary Fund for a broadly similar amount. So the question that I'm interested in under the auspices of the law of state responsibility is whether the capacity of the responsible state to pay compensation is a relevant legal criteria. And so I think if we think about it in terms of analogy in domestic law, if we think about this perhaps as, of, as a version of tort law, as it were, tort law is usually approaching this from the intellectual tradition of corrective justice. We want to reestablish the situation that would have prevailed if the wrongful act had not taken place. Now, I know literally nothing at all about uh, Indian approaches to tort law, but I would imagine that some proposition to that effect would be reflected in the leading cases. And so our focus is on the injury. Our focus is on the loss. Our focus is on the victim. We are not really majorly interested in the capacity of the responsible actor to satisfy it. Now, 
of course, at some point, the legal system is concerned about it. Uh, if uh, the person is incapable of uh, paying the debt, it does not mean that they can uh, be thrown on the street and let starve. But importantly, that is not something that domestic law will address at the level of content and scope of responsibility. It is something that courts may deal at the level of enforcement. You know, again, one imagines that at the level of enforcement, there would be certain minimum amounts uh, necessary for survival that uh, judicial procedure will leave. Or it is something that would be addressed through uh, bankruptcy laws or other aspects. Now, the hard question for international law is that international law does not really have structures of such a character. Uh, there is no sovereign bankruptcy of the sort. So what I'm interested in to explore in this paper is whether we can walk through international law state responsibility and identify any way in which, uh, you know, India or Pakistan or other states uh, facing very significant claims may say that this is going too far because if we have to comply with it, we would have to very significantly compromise our ability to provide basic public goods. So essentially, we either have health and education or we pay a multi-billion award. So that is really the policy question. Is that a consideration that international law uh, accepts as legally relevant? Oh, let me just, as it were, put first you within the intellectual framework that I will be operating something that I would imagine you uh, have had a look at in the setting of some module. And that is uh, the document adopted by the International Law Commission in 2001, um, 2001 ILC articles on responsibility of states for uh, internationally wrongful acts. So going in the history, the result of almost uh, half a century of very hard conceptual analytical work, having gone through five special rapporteurs, uh, concluding under the auspices of the Swiss special rapporteur, currently a judge of the International Court of Justice, James Crawford, under whose guidance the International Law Commission eventually in 2001 adopted in second reading uh, articles on a state responsibility. What is the structure of these articles? And this is, I think, something that is often thought to be more of a civil law than a common law approach. Intellectually speaking, uh, International Law Commission adopted an approach of cross-cutting secondary rules. So in analytical terms, the International Law Commission said we will tell you what the consequences are for breaches of any obligation. So they may be obligations under investment law, human rights law, environmental law, law on the use of force. We are not really hugely concerned about the substance of those obligations, but we think it is helpful to provide with some general background rules what happens when they are breached. I think that there is an interesting story to pursue uh, elsewhere why International Law Commission adopted that perspective. And there are really interesting politics of the Cold War for why the issue was framed in the way how it was framed. But so under current international law, uh, state responsibility is conceived as consisting of three parts. Part one tells us uh, what the internationally wrongful act of the state is. I think that these are probably rules that you would be familiar with. Uh, a great deal of discussion about attribution. So what is a state? Uh, how do we determine whether an international obligation has been breached? What about situations of shared responsibility? What about circumstances for the clothing on? So various kinds of rules that go to the, as it were, originating factor. Is there a wrongful act in the first place? So there has been a great deal of 
really excellent research done on the topic, and that is not something that I'm directly interested in here. What I'm interested in here is part two, and part two deals with content of the international responsibility of a state that I always found is a slightly, I mean, not quite counterintuitive title, but certainly not an intuitive one. But what uh, the International Law Commission meant by content is the consequences of responsibility. What is it that the responsible state has to do? What does it have to do to repair uh, the wrongful act? And here, the intellectual assumption is provided in Article 31, and that is full reparation for the injury cause. So again, there are sort of all, all sorts of bells and whistles surrounding it, but the key point is full reparation. Uh, and that full reparation can be affected in by three forms. Restitution, compensation, or satisfaction. I think restitution is perhaps the more intuitive one. It can be factual. I took a thing wrongfully. I return a thing. It may be a juridical one. I engaged in certain conduct in breach of international law, adopted a domestic law, engaged in judicial proceedings, so I have to reverse it. So that is restitution. Satisfaction is perhaps a little bit of an oddball rule, but that really builds on classic old ideas of offense to honor of the state and, you know, with apologies and uh, acknowledgements and such. Uh, the interesting thing that we see if we look at both of these rules is that there is a certain inbuilt limit against excessiveness. International Law Commission accepts that both of those can go too far. And Article 35B tells us that restitution cannot be essentially disproportionate. And Article 37.3 says the same thing. Satisfaction shall not be out of proportion and shall not be humiliated. Uh, so those are, as it were, the two bracketed forms of reparation. What we are interested in this uh, lecture, however, is Article 36 and compensation. And if we look at the way how compensation is explained, we see that it is lacking the type of limitation against disproportionate effect that the other two have. Now, that was not an oversight. And if we go to the commentary in or to the ILC articles, a commentary five to ILC article 34 says that, as I have highlighted, concerns have been expressed about disproportionate and crippling compensa uh, crippling requirements there. And uh, ILC addresses it squarely. It says, well, there is no general limitation. And it operates differently for each rule. So restitution, as we just saw, is excluded if it is disproportionate. Satisfaction must also not be disproportionate. And compensation, says the ILC, and I think that this is a key point, so let me just sort of bring it up, is limited to damage actually suffered. So by necessary implication, the International Law Commission says, this is not something that has a limitation on amount. So we are interested to look seriously at causality issues, but if the uh, damage has been caused, that is it. So how did the International Law Commission approach this issue? And this is very interesting. This is not one of those situations where the International Law Commission might have, you know, not thought of or not reflected on a particular matter. Uh, this is something that was addressed fairly squarely and spot on. And this is something that, uh, and you know, again, going back to the procedure of the International Law Commission, International Law Commission has the procedure of two readings. Uh, the 
documents, outputs are first adopted, as it were, in the first reading, and then a number of years pass, usually in more recent practice, two years, but uh, historically possibly a greater amount, when states uh, reflect uh, through the uh, Sixth Committee of the United Nations General Assembly, the Sixth Legal Committee, on that document and provide comments. So that is, I think, the interesting point about the International Law Commission, the close interlinkage and interplay that it has with states. The International Law Commission is, on the one hand, an independent expert body, so to speak, the think tank of the United Nations General Assembly. On the other hand, it has this close feedback loop. Every year it would be adopting the uh, annual report in uh, late summer and every year in mid-autumn uh, the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly will provide an opportunity for states to comment on these outputs. So an absolutely unique opportunity for an independent body to work with a close eye to state feedback. And I think that this is really why International Law Commission's products have been uh, on many occasions, very influential in shaping international law. Uh, because even when the members are academics, they are operating, as it were, very much with an eye to the realities of the United Nations politics. There is a sense of what is possible and what is not possible, and that certainly shapes the outcomes. So state responsibility project, as I said, was peculiar because it has taken a very long time. And in 1996, it had been finally adopted in the first reading. Uh, and the International Law Commission is elected for five years. And in 1997, the next quinquennium was adopted. And James Crawford, then professor, now Judge Crawford, was appointed as the fifth special rapporteur with the task of concluding the uh, work on the second reading by 2001, when the commission would leave. And the way how Judge Crawford approached it is by preparing four reports. So he went through various aspects of state responsibility law, and in report number three, uh, adopt, that he uh, prepared for 2000, he looked at content of responsibility. And uh, it's a marvelously clearly written uh, paper, uh, I think really uh, you know, a, a reflection of international reasoning at its finest, uh, facing uh, squarely the hard questions and engaging with them explicitly. So I think if you are looking at any of the state responsibility issues and trying to understand why something was presented in the final articles, the way how it was, uh, also reading the final results side by side with the relevant report by Crawford, I have always found a very helpful side set. So this is what this is what Judge Crawford said about the topic in the third report. So he says the issue of limiting crippling compensation has been discussed. Uh, how do we think about this? And fundamentally, he was sort of inclined to agree with the position given in a paragraph 163. So Judge Crawford you know, made a number of points. He said, first, uh, Concerns about that such large claims were exaggerated. Uh, and he looked at the practice uh, on the topic uh, that was there at the end of the century. And he said, well, there are uh, mostly claims are not that large if measured against the general capacity of the state. And see, he was mostly looking at human rights claims then. And occasionally, when uh, claims are large, uh, they can be addressed. And I think that this is sort of perhaps, uh, you know, uh, that they may be perhaps sometimes in the context of the of the particular institutions, like uh, 
the United Nations Compensation Commission. Now, that is something that you may have had a look at uh, in other parts of your research. UNCC was an institution that was set up by the Security Council to uh, evaluate claims uh, against Iraq arising uh, out of various aspects of invasion of Kuwait, and that was building on its um, oil wealth. Uh, but I think that in that setting, and this is sort of something that comes up in the discussion in the um, more generally, the, there the key point is that there were certain limitations that Security Council already included itself so just to continue, I think that so the point that I was making was that so for Judge Crawford, the first question was whether this was a real problem. And he felt that it wasn't. And that in most cases, like in the regional human rights settings, uh, the uh, claims were not that large. When they were larger, like in the United Nations Compensation Commission, the foundational documents already included certain limitations. So. Uh, there were limitations that there was a certain percentage uh, of the oil proceeds that would necessarily be going to Iraq and its people. So that concern was addressed at the institutional level. And then he felt that to the extent that these claims do arise, uh, they could either be addressed simply through political wisdom that states would uh, appreciate that it doesn't make sense to push extreme claims forward. And there, I think there's a little bit of that, you know, the fian de siècle sense, the end of century sense, looking back at the 20th century and being, I think, you know, 1990s for international law was fundamentally an optimistic uh, period. End of the Cold War, sort of beginning of what's seen at that point, a more enlightened future where international law institutions play a greater role. And particularly, so there was a very much of sort of the, the one book that was prominently there was Keynes' Economic Consequences of Peace, uh, where Keynes uh, famously uh, was hugely critical of the Versailles settlement uh, against Germany and feeling that Germany was being uh, destroyed, the Cartesian peace, uh, so to speak. Now, I think that there's a very big historical debate about the extent to which that is a fair criticism of the Versailles Treaty, but that is certainly something that the International Law Commission was influenced by. And so they felt that if they compared the post-First World, World War situation, that I think that there was sort of the narrative that Versailles was a bad deal, it imposed a crushing uh, peace on Germany, and as, as a result, it was unsustainable against post-Second World War uh, situations where uh, sort of it was felt that the victorious allied powers were wise and generous. And even if they could have pushed the claims, they didn't push them. Uh, they often waived the claims. And I think, again, you can uh, think appreciate in, in the broader Asian region that there may be hard questions about what claims can be waived regarding what entities, but that was really the broader narrative. So cases will not arise. When they do arise, they will be uh, addressed at the institutional level or by the policy wisdom. And if they do come to the staff, then perhaps circumstances precluding wrongfulness could play their role. And I think that that is and, and I think I just really want to be honest that my argument is not going against, um, you know, a trivial afterthought. I'm really challenging International Law Commission at its strongest, which possible was probably one of the sharpest international lawyers of our times and his explicit argument. And the claim that I'm making is that these assumptions, while perfectly plausible and probably even, you know, most likely in 2000 are not really those of 2021. And if we look at uh, the practice and the international legal dynamic in 2021, I think that at least it seems to me that many of these assumptions have been proven not entirely persuasive. So 
we are having more and more of very significant uh, billion dollar plus awards in uh, human rights cases and particularly in investor state arbitration. And I gave you these examples from Kern and India and Tethyan Copper and Pakistan. And there are other cases as well against Venezuela, uh, Egypt and Ecuador in the last years. Uh, and so I think, why did that happen? And probably the one thing that, as we now know in retrospect, was perhaps not fully appreciated was really the rise that we can sort of see in retrospect in the 1990s of the non-state actor and their economic injury claims. And here, I think there is perhaps a slightly contrarian point, often in international law, it is progressive uh, to argue for greater inclusion of non-state actors. And we may feel that interstate dynamic is too cynical and too self-centered and too real politic. But I think that it's also important to acknowledge that states uh, provide an important tempering element. States are repeat players. States know that arguments that they are making today will contribute to emergence of the rule that may be invoked against them tomorrow. They have an enlightened interest in maintenance of the system, of not pushing the system to the brink. Non-state actors are explicitly not repeat players, and that is not meant to be any particular criticism of non-state actors, but in the human rights setting as well, a human rights claimant is not interested in the systemic balance between the states. A non-state actor who is claiming before a human rights tribunal is interested in maximum protection of their rights. And that is a perfectly logical systemic consequence of this uh, procedural regime. But one implication was that crippling compensation claims that would not have been posed by states because states would have had at the back of their mind hesitance. If I push the claim today, in 50 years, the claim will be pushed against me. So I will better not push the legal principle to the extreme. Non-state actors do not have that concern. So I think that that is one sort of the broader uh, backdrop. The other one is, I think, perhaps the sort of the, the trust in the political wisdom and institutions of 1990s has been slightly tempered. Uh, you know, you have looked at United Nations, and I think if we look at the last 15, 20 years, there are certainly many instances where, um, well, I think that we probably cannot be optimistic about the institutional political wisdom and capacity of states in institutional settings to arrive at a consensus and to provide effective solutions. So most of the solutions that Judge Crawford identified do not seem to be realistic. And if we go to particular arguments like circumstances precluding wrongfulness, they as well seem extraordinarily hard to invoke in practice. So if we look at necessity or force majeure as circumstance precluding wrongfulness, they have really never been successfully invoked in any, as it were, real life litigation. So the question, of course, uh, is still whether despite these concerns that I identified, uh, International law has developed in the direction of a different rule. And I will not go into excessive incredible detail over all my legal arguments. I think it's, so the article goes on in nitty gritty, but let me just say, I suppose really the broader questions that have to be posed here. State responsibility law is almost entirely customary law. Customary law, again, as a very basic proposition, is composed of um, state practice and opinio juris. Even a very well established rules of customary law may be changed. I think that there is a bigger question mark about change and peremptory rules, but I think that on this context, uh, full reparation is not a peremptory rule. States can 
waive and compromise uh, for reparation. Uh, they can conclude settlements, they can completely waive claims. So that is certainly not a peremptory one. So the question that I was really interested in my paper is whether we can say that IOC's position has been superseded by state practice. That even though in 2001, IOC felt that there was no exception to compensation by reference, as it were, to its effects, now the position is a different one. And perhaps somewhat counterintuitively, I think perhaps really the structure of my argument seems to be suggestive that I will say that I'm unpersuaded by the ILC in 2001, therefore a different position prevails. Actually, my conclusion is that even though the ILC's approach was not irrefutable in 2001, it actually has been broadly accepted by states. Occasionally, explicitly, but mostly really by implication. And the really the way how it has been mostly accepted, and I think that this is really a sort of a real life example how international lawmaking works is by failing to raise objections when objections would have been otherwise expected. In particular, states, when faced by multi-billion claims that they would have very significant problems in satisfying, have not argued that we think that there is a problem here. You cannot really award a multi-billion claim against us. They have argued on all other points. They have challenged causality. They have challenged contribution or mitigation. They have argued on valuation. But one thing that is prominently lacking is uh, the argument about uh, crippling compensation as a, a relevant legal concept. So what are the things that I looked at in my paper? So one thing I looked is the really the way how states looked at the question, as it were, reacting to the debates in the International Law Commission. And there, the reactions by states were mixed. And there were some states who were very strongly objecting against any exception to crippling compensation. And loosely, I think we could say that those were states coming from capital exporting global north, particularly 1990. So United States and United Kingdom were particularly vocal in that regard. And France, uh, Japan, Italy, Australia and Israel were also speaking out in a critical manner. There are also some states that were intervening in uh, support of some exception. And that was a more mixed group of states. Um, Bahrain, Czech Republic, Chile and Germany. And Germany, interestingly enough, was building on the same, one might say, Versailles type argument and saying that in uh, claims arising out of uh, war reparations, there was a significant tendency, like in the practice of the United Nations Compensation Commission, to limit uh, the uh, awards by reference to the capacity of the responsible state and its peoples to satisfy. I think ultimately there seemed to be a little bit more of a support by states that argued against any exception, but on balance, I think that, you know, uh, there was just global north in favor of one position, a more mixed uh, body of states in favor of the other one. So I don't think that it really weighs strongly one way or the other. The other interesting stream of practice uh, comes from dispute settlement. And as I said, in dispute settlement, it's quite common for, I mean, if there is a setting where we, we really would expect states to make an argument explicitly, it is in dispute settlement. You are in a formalized setting, you are thinking with your client, what is the best counter argument that I can make as a respondent? Presumably, if there is a huge multi-billion claim, all options will be explored. At some point, there will be a memo drawn up which will say, why don't we argue that this is an impossible amount for us to satisfy? 
And the fact that states have appear not to have raised that argument in investment arbitration or really in human rights setting where there have been some significant cases as well in the last 15 years seems to be suggestive that at some point the issue went high up and somebody said, well, this is an unsustainable legal argument. If we put it forward, this is something that will undermine our broader position on the question of principle. And that really strikes me as uh, the ultimate really reflection of opinion on non juris that if you are faced with a multi-billion claim and if you have an argument and if you don't make it, it must mean that somebody made a judgment call that it was a very bad argument indeed. And indeed, if I could just make the, an additional point here, there was one case, uh, one uh, setting where uh, crippling compensation actually was accepted of sorts in the Eritrea-Ethiopia Claims Commission, uh, where both states, after a significant interstate armed conflict, made damages claims against each other. And the commission said, you know, we are concerned that these uh, claims may be going too far. They may be going too far. And so we may be, uh, we may get into a place where we might have to cap them. Uh, so that you are capable of complying with your basic human rights obligations. Um, and that was a very interesting uh, decision. It was in late uh, noughties, sort of, I think it was, you know, 2007, 2009, uh, that period of time. And the reaction by international legal community is a fascinating one because international law is a process. And what matters at the end of the day is whether states and institutions pick up certain arguments or don't pick up. So on many points, I think in addition to considering whether a particular judgment or a particular argument is persuasive is a question of reception. Did anybody invoke them? Did states pick up these arguments and invoke them in practice? Did the institutions endorse them? Did tribunals endorse them? And uh, the Eritrea Appeal Claims Commission's approach on this particular issue has never been, as far as I'm aware, cited by any state or any uh, tribunal. Indeed, it was, I think this is a really a wonderfully mean a turn of phrase, it was referred to as part of the International Law Commission's work on uh, armed conflict and environment, where the special rapporteur noted that that approach was quote unquote interesting for quote unquote not following the traditional approach. Now, I think interesting is really the most damning thing that can be said about a legal argument. And I think that is sort of really what I'm really driving at. There were arguments that parties could have relied on. It wasn't something that they had to imagine themselves. They didn't. And I think that is a very important uh, confirmation that international law in general has come out uh, in the direction uh, that uh, Judge Crawford and 2000 ILC, one ILC articles went to. So even though the underlying assumptions have shifted, the legal process has endorsed the approach. And I think that there are also some other aspects in the ILC's work, particularly as part of its work on responsibility of international organizations, which goes in a similar direction. Um, and in my article, I look at some other aspects that also at treaty law and at general principles, and I conclude ultimately that uh, the broader system may permit us to look very generously and charitably at uh, possible challenges to crippling compensation, but at the end of the day, it has to be invoked. It has to be argued for, and that simply hasn't taken a place so far. So where do we go from here? And uh, that is the sort of the future looking a uh, concluding part. And here I suggest that there are three futures that we can look at. Uh, one future is, um, you know, one future is the present. Uh, 
the idea that uh, crippling compensation is not uh, regulated at the level of content of responsibility. We don't really care uh, how easily India could allocate $1 billion or how easily Pakistan could allocate, reallocate multi-billion dollars. That is not something that valuation and coming up with quantum is concerned with. Uh, and the fact that states are not really invoking this as an argument seems to me most likely that that will be the rule going forward. The second possible direction is really taking seriously Judge Crawford's alternatives and uh, saying that to the extent that uh, such claims are arising, states should take seriously the drafting of primary obligations within investment law, uh, possibly within the broader human rights and humanitarian law rubrics. If not a primary obligations, then perhaps dispute settlement mechanisms. Institutions have to take these matters into account. And there are ways of how to really address it at the level of drafting. You know, to go back to the United Nations Compensation Commission, uh, Security Council resolution simply said that a certain percentage of oil proceeds can be used for satisfying UNCC claims against Iraq others have to be allocated to the people of Iraq. And as we know, in retrospect, it was probably an excessively small percentage, but that really you know, suggests the sort of the type of thinking that one could uh, affect in drafting. And finally, and this is perhaps, I think the, uh, the more courageous aspect of the argument, that we can also think of the way forward of how to change the law and there I suggest that there could be ways of invoking these issues in particular disputes including in treaties or other instruments where states speak about customary law introducing them in international organizations in United Nations as well as elsewhere so in, in a sense taking full advantage of the opportunities that are provided by the formalized legal process. Uh, and really, I think, I think this is really sort of my concluding point that I mean, recall that how much turned in 1990s by practice and interventions of a very limited number of states. You know, six or seven states intervening for one position, four or five for another one all from the 190-ish uh, states. And I mean, I don't want to be unrealistic on these matters. And I appreciate that on many of these points, the capacity of states to contribute on issues of international law is dictated by resources that different states can allocate to legal expertise. And plainly, a Security Council permanent member uh, has the capacity on resources to dedicate uh, lawyers to such international law issues than a least developed state. And I'm not at all being you know, unrealistic about this. But at the same time, I think that within the modern international law, there are ways for even traditionally smaller, traditionally less active actors to be represented whether acting through uh, broader regional groups. You know, again, if we go back to the International Law Commission, a very inspiring recent example is the work of the uh, island, uh, Pacific Island states on the topic of sea level rise under international law. So there are ways how international legal process can be uh, approached by all actors. I mean, of course, you know, equally, the larger actors could try to uh, take advantage of it in a traditional way. But I think that would be sort of really the, the bigger claim that I'm trying to make uh, by my paper. World is imperfect, uh, but uh, international law is perhaps the uh, least imperfect uh, reflection of the universality that I think we may, we should all be inspiring to in international relations. Thank you. So I may add a couple of words. First of all, thank you, Martins, for this excellent presentation and 
Um, I'm sorry, I had to go uh, out and be back for, for some time, but what uh, is very interesting on state responsibility for material damages is that uh, in the situation of uh, Security Council uh, authorization, uh, as it was in the case of liberation of Kuwait back in 1991, the resolution 678 of the Security Council authorized use of force to liberate Kuwait from Iraq. And uh, damage done by this intervention, so to speak, which was led by United States, Britain and 40 other countries. Those who lost their properties or businesses made a compensation act and the compensation done by uh, the army of United States, for example, uh, was still located as a state re responsibility, not to United States, but to Iraq, because the uh, the compensation committee found that nevertheless, no matter who did it, the fact that the Security Council authorized use of force, uh, member states cooperating with the government of Kuwait, including United States, do this under the obligation of the Security Council authorization. And the damage had to be paid by Iraq, not by those who actually committed the intervention. Very, very interesting story because it, it suggests that if Iraq did not invade Kuwait in 1990, there won't be a Security Council resolution, there won't be an intervention. Therefore, still the compensation are to be paid by Iraq. And that's exactly what has been done later with the Compensation Committee. The exchange of oil revenue from uh, the sale of Iraq, exporting the Iraqi oil cover compensation for properties and damages done by United States or Britain or whoever it might be. Do we have more questions? I'm sorry for coming a bit late into that. Uh, Akriti, do you uh, see your hands up? Uh, no, Professor. Uh, let me express our thanks to Professor Paparinkis. It was great pleasure to see you. And I hope next time we can meet in person in India, in our campus. Uh, have you been, by the way, to our campus? If not yet, be our guest. Uh, we will definitely want to bring you there soon, as soon as possible, depending on the vaccination and everything else, it, which goes uh, quite uh, efficiently these days, I think, all over the world. So I hope the borders will open and we can see you in person in hopefully next, uh, early next year, probably. But thank you very much for your time. It, it was very um, elucidating and I'm sure our students did enjoy uh, your deliberation on uh, uh, state responsibility for crippling co com damage compensations and, and, and broadly about the um, so many developments which um, current modern international law has experienced. I'm, I'm sure you, you will remain in touch with Ankit and uh, this uh, series really goes very well so far. We, we had uh, amazing speakers like yourself today. Uh, we are thinking of uh, continuing the series uh, over the next month and years. And th thank you also Ankit for your great effort to bring uh, Professor Paparinskis, but also many others into into general society of international law. Have have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks for having me, and it was a real pleasure.